is this guy here, our magnet. He's now gone. This is the last time we're going to see him because we're going to do something entirely different. The next thing is if I say uh, site investigation. Actually, did you ever play that game? Like, okay, I say banana, and then guys, if you say banana, I say orange, you say orange, I say green, and whatever, right? So I say site investigation. What do you say? What do you, what do you often do in site investigation? What are you looking for? It's all you guys do. <laughs> you like to you decide this. What do you do? Outcrops. Pardon me? Outcrops. Outcrops. Look for outcrops. Pardon me? Survey. Look for things you can't see. Good. Yeah. Well, now we're getting closer. What what th what things might not you see? Subsurface. Subsurface. And what parts? Of, what are you looking for often? The sticker thing. The Yeah. Anything else? Like gas lines and stuff like that. Oh yeah, cultural stuff. Yeah. Uh, what about bedrock? Ever play a role? Yes. What about you know saturated versus unsaturated zones? As you got to get into your stratigraphy. Uh, this is now the kind of problem that we're, we're going to deal with. So it's going to be an entirely different kind of uh, physical property. So now we're going to go into something called seismology. And we're going to do three different things in here, but they're going to all be kind of tied together. One is going to be refraction. The other is going to be reflection. And the other one is called MASW. I want to spend this lecture and Monday, uh, kind of concentrating on the basic uh, aspects of, of seismology. We're going to look at physical properties that are involved. Uh, we're going to look at how waves travel in the Earth. We're going to look at the seismic refraction problem. And I'm going to show you how, by doing an experiment sitting up at the surface, that you're actually going to be able to put energy into the ground, have it travel along some kind of an interface, and record it coming up here. And with that information, you're actually going to be able to tell you know, what the thickness of this guy is and what the velocity is up top and the velocity down underneath here, and so that you can actually characterize where that uh, bedrock is. So here's an example uh, where these guys uh, are kind of doing a pile driving for a bridge someplace in, in, in Napa Valley. And the goal to try to kind of figure out, okay, where is the, you know, the bedrock in this case uh, can be attacked by the thing I just uh, put out on, on the board. We've, we've got an earth that might look like this. You've got maybe an unsaturated soil, <laughs> water saturated soils, then a bedrock. And the goal is somehow to do a geophysical experiment, which is going to be a seismic experiment, where we're going to put some energy off into the ground and where we're going to record some signal at various uh, detectors. So our generic uh, uh, types of plot is, is like this. We've got we've got a source, in, input some energy, we've got a subsurface with some physical properties, and we're going to measure a response. In our case here, the response is actually going to be kind of looking something like this. This is this is a function of time, and this is a function of ground motion as as time proceeds. And you know, there's going to be different things that are coming in at different times, different amplitudes. And we're actually going to try to make, understand what that signal is, decode it, and make some use of it. The physical properties that we're going to talk about are seismic velocities. They're denoted as a BP, which stands for primary. 
and the S, which stands for a shear, sometimes this is called pressure, and this is uh, a shear. So VP and, and VS, we're going to talk a fair bit about them. Seismic velocities are something that uh, usually geological engineers are not you know, particularly uh, connected with, uh, although you did see in the... Um, in, in the first lab, you had this little experiment, right, where you did the VP and VS, so actually those, those words are already familiar to you. But there's, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, ways of describing elastic properties of, uh, of, of materials. Uh, perhaps the one that you're most f familiar with, I would guess, is maybe Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. Uh, but you could also do bulk modulus and shear modulus. That's what was you saw in that first lab. Uh, there's shear modulus and Lame's first parameters, or just uh, P and S wave velocities. So there's a whole bunch of descriptions, and I, because the you know different people and different walks of life tend to use different words. There's a table. It's, it's kind of complicated to look at, especially when it's reduced in size, but it's, it's on the website and it comes from a group called Agile and they make uh, a lot of open source uh, materials for, for education. And what we have along this uh, axis here are just the names of elastic parameters. So you have Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio, bulk modulus, shear modulus, Lame parameter, P wave velocity, S wave velocity, and ratio P to S. Right? So that's what's along this axis. And along this axis, we've got the various uh, descriptions. So engineers are basically in this line here. So we're going to work uh, with Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, but to get to anything else, so you work in E and mu, and to get to anything else, there's, there's a relationship. So the idea is that whether you're a geophysicist or an engineer or a rock physicist, you're kind of using different descriptions of the elastic uh, parameters, but they're all interrelated. There's, there's really only three, and somehow they all have to be connected with each other. And this is a table that uh, does that. I think from our particular point of view, and given that you're geological engineers, the thing that's most important uh, is your shear modulus, and that is related to the density as well as the uh, shear velocity. So we can, we got Vs squared times rho, that gives you the, the shear modulus. And Young's modulus depends both upon the P wave and the S wave velocity as well as the density. So there's the connection. If you're interested in mu and E, and if we go ahead and we do some experiments that give you the P wave and the S wave velocity, uh, then, okay, you're, you're back connected with stuff that's really intrinsically uh, interesting to you or that you're used to working on. So I, I, don't, I don't really want to go through a lot of details here uh, in, in the course with respect to stresses and strains and the definition of these things. You've, you've seen them all before and we've just refactored the uh, GPG website and I'm just going to kind of flip through and you, 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 can, you can read this. So if you go under physical properties and then you go to seismic, uh, seismic velocity, then you're, you'll see something, huh. Oh, I have to, sorry, what do I have to do? How do I get this screen to show? Yeah, ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. You guys could be in a lot of trouble if Lindsay wasn't here. <laughs> okay, so this is what, this is what you'll see. So you've got, in other physical properties, there's seismic velocities, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff, 
under here. Uh, there's elastic deformations. So we start with uh, shear, normal stress, uh, tensile stress, uh, shear stress. Uh, there's the bulk and the shear modulus, which you've seen. Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio, and uh, then it's going to get into different uh, types of velocities. So just to kind of, I'm going to hit that in a second, but just to kind of give you an idea of materials and the P wave and S wave velocities, uh, this gives you a bit of a uh, kind of a, kind of an overview. If you have air, then air can uh, still uh, transmit a a P wave velocity. So we'll we'll talk a bit more about that. But uh, a P wave is a uh, it, it is a pressure wave. So it's just exactly the same wave that we have when we're when we're speaking, right? So you kind of all know how that works, right? Uh, I've got some vocal cords here, and air goes through, and it vibrates the vocal cords, and you know there's always this uh, compression that goes out, so compressions and rarefactions, and uh, you pick that up, your vocal cords start to, uh, you know, to, to or your earlobes start to vibrate, and then uh, that gets transmitted as a signal. So that's your P wave velocity, and the uh, Velocity of air is uh, about 340 meters per second. Uh, if we look at water, it's about uh, three to four times that, so it's about 1,500 meters per second. Oil's about 1,200. Uh, wet sands are 12 to 15. Uh, coal, 2,200. And then as you get into the rocks, you get into limestones. Those are you know, 3,500, you know, three kilometers to six kilometers per second, and basalts are, you know, five to, to six. Then the shear wave velocities uh, have, have a table also that looks like that, and you'll notice that the shear wave velocity is always less than the P. Again, we'll come back to that. But anyway, so there, there you have it. The uh, elastic properties, uh, P wave and S wave velocities for what we're going to do, uh, it, you can connect it to... Uh, engineering properties, and there's a table and some background about what's going on. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe the one thing that's... Uh, Maybe we'll go here just a second. Yeah, so I'm going to come back a little bit to uh, just how things are, are are traveling. And the question is, okay, if we've got energy in the ground, the, the way to think about all of this is just to you know, basically think about sound waves and how uh, how sound propagated. So as I was explaining with respect to the ear and the pressure waves, uh, you can get a sense of how you can actually transmit energy from one place to the other and there's other stuff on, on the website. In our particular case here, those quote sound waves are actually going to be propagated uh, because of the elasticity of the earth material. So we're going to set off a uh, <clears throat> some kind of, of a source, which is actually going to be a physical source. We're going to push something in some direction. So it could be an explosion where you just blast out everything, or it could be some motion that you're uh, just imparting on, on here. And that energy is going to go down and, and, and propagate up. And the speed at which it travels uh, is going to depend upon the elastic properties of this Earth. And that's going to be, in particular, the uh, c compressional, uh, uh, compression modulus or the bulk modulus, as well as the, the shear modulus. So 
I'm not sure you guys have probably seen this. It's kind of like a little simple thing, but it actually is effective. So I need 10 volunteers. It's Friday. Yeah, yeah, please. Just, and just line up. <laughs> So I, I want you to line up uh, like facing me and put your arms on the next person. <laughs> oh no. So you can actually think of the, you can think of your okay, so you've got all these materials in your and you can actually think about them as being kind of connected by strings, right? That's where the term elastic comes from, right? And so the question is, if I then go and somehow make uh, some kind of a motion that is going on here, can we actually get energy propagating? So the, the idea here is, I could do something here, we could get energy propagating all the way through, but not necessarily by having a person at the end run to the, run to the forefront. Right? It's, it's, it's a way of propagating energy. So first of all, hold, hold your hands really stiff, okay, against it. Oh, you have to, yeah, have to take one step forward. <laughs> okay, so everybody's really stiff? So if you're really stiff, it's like having a, you know, a big, strong bulk modulus, right? So now what I'm going to do, I'm just going to push, okay? Ready? Oh, but you even got a reflection. That's even better. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to do that again. <laughs> so there's, yeah, so, so you, you, you see a couple things. You can actually see that energy travel, right? It, it went at a particular, it went at a particular speed. I'm going to ask them to do one more thing. Instead of holding, you know, really stiff, something that's really rigid material, we're going to do, I, I'm going to ask them just to not be really super relaxed, but just less tight, a little bit more, more relaxed. And I'm going to push on here, and I want you to watch two things. I want you to watch the speed of the wave compared to what we had before, and I want to watch, have you watch the amplitude. Okay? So watch the speed and watch how much this first person moves compared to last. Okay, ready? Because I'm, I'm consistent for source, right? So no problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, one more. Okay, so so you so you okay, so don't don't go. We're here for the afternoon. <laughs> okay, so what 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 did you notice about the you know the differences in those in, in those two things? Let's let's go to the, the velocity. Was one noticeably faster than the other? Yeah. The first one, yes. So the first one, when things were really rigidly tight together, uh, you know, it propagates that energy very, very quickly. The second thing is that when things were not coupled together very well, we, not only did the wave travel slower, it just kind of dissipated. So we just kind of lost it. The third is, which way was the energy flowing? That way, right? Started here, energy's out there. Good. Which way, if we talked about you guys as being particles, okay? Which way were they moving? Right, you went this way and you went back, right? Because you went whoop. So the the energy is moving this way, so this is this is a compressional wave. The energy is moving this way, the particles are moving this way. It's good. Okay, I want you to grab hold of the shoulders again, really tight. Okay, ready? Okay, we're going to do the same thing, except I'm going to push a little different. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Well, we made it. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was eight, faster or slower? Or slower. Then we do it again, okay? <laughs> 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 so, okay, so you, you, you can see what happens, right? So which way did the energy go? Which way did the particles go? Yeah. So the particle motion was transverse to the direction of propagation of, of the energy. So we've got, so this was a shearing motion, okay, that we, that we did, and you can see that 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 propagates energy, and if we could do it, which we can't, I mean, I could have whipped it up or down, right? <laughs> we're not going to go there. Uh, so we could get we could get this shearing energy go going in that direction. The particles are different, and uh, but the energy comes the same. Thanks, guys. Okay, so it's kind of simple. Yeah, give them a hand, right? <laughs> Um, let's see. Where? Uh, right. So let's, we could do that again. So there's a number of different kinds of waves that we can have, and there's a number of different kinds of uh, of, of particle motion that we can actually. I could even go. Hold on, just a second. Maybe this is better. Okay, so. This was our uh, spring model of the Earth. So we've got the atoms that are all kind of connected by by, by springs. And we've got this bulk modulus and, and, and shear modulus. And the first wave that we did was this guy here. So you can see what, what's happening here. So this is what's called the P wave or the compressional wave. And it's doing exactly what we just did, right? So it's uh, it's being pushed this way, and and you can see the compressions, and then the rarefactions as as that goes. So the energy propagates down this way, the particle motion is back and forth, and this little box that we've got here uh, kind of squeezes in and then ex expands out as as things go through. Okay. That's the P wave, that was the first one that we did. And the velocity of that P wave depends upon the compressional uh, bulk modulus as well as the shear modulus and the density. So that was the expression. This is called a body wave because it travels inside the Earth, or maybe because it had a whole bunch of bodies. Too. But uh, it's, we're going to refer to this guy as a, a body wave something that really travels inside the Earth. The second wave that we just did, the motion was transverse. So it's a shearing motion. And you can see what it's done. It's, so you, you can see how it's changing the shape. This is not changing volume. These little cells all keep their same volume, but they're, they're sheared. They're, twisted in, in, in shape, you can see how, how you do that. And again, that particle motion is transverse to the direction of, of propagation. So that's the shear velocity. So that depends <coughs> upon the, the shear modulus divided by the density. Remember I said that uh, the P wave velocity for air was 343 meters per second. Uh, I said there was no shear wave velocity. What's going on in here? If I have air, what's 
Would I expect to shear wave? No. No. And why? The air particles are not directly attached to each other. That's right. So there's no to she the shear modulus is, is zero. I could I could take two air particles and you know I could push one like this and it doesn't affect the other guy at, at, at all. So the velocity for any liquid, air is a liquid. So water, air, anything that acts as a liquid, then the shear velocity is actually going to be equal to zero. And you notice also that the shear wave velocity is got to be less than the P wave velocity. Anybody? Care to comment about why that is? Formula one, formula two. Yeah, so they're both divided by rho, but this has got a mu. Shear wave velocity just got a mu. That's got four thirds mu plus a kappa, right? So. The P wave velocity is always faster than the shear wave velocity. In addition to body waves, we also have what are called surface waves. And from anybody here who is in civil engineering, do we have anybody that's concerned? Who or geological engineer? Are you concerned about? The structural rigidity of some building to a standard earthquake. Mm -hmm. Coming to play? Really? Vancouver is a good place to be considered about that. Okay, so we've got some kind of um, source, ground motion, maybe it's an earthquake, uh, maybe it's an explosive source. There's, there's waves that come down into the earth, okay, so those were the body waves, you know, the P wave velocity, the F, or the P wave, the S wave, but we can also get waves that travel along the surface, and reasonably enough, those are called surface waves. There's two kinds. The first is something called the Rayleigh wave, and this is a manifestation of that. The wave travels along the surface. The amplitude decreases as you go down in depth. And the particle motion is a retrograde ellipse. So the particle, if you looked at any particular particle, it's actually going around like that. If you had a little, sometimes they show examples where you've got a little cork that's sitting on water or something like that. And you look at to see what that is. And you can see that that just is sort of going around like that. So that's the Rayleigh wave. Uh, velocity, that's the Rayleigh wave and particle motion. And then there's also something called a love wave. <laughs> and again, this is much more related to the, to the, to the shear. So the energy is moving this way, and the particle motion is moving back and forth, but it's confined to a surface, and the amplitude decreases as you, uh, as, as you go down in depth. Uh, so can I ask you not to text or things like that while we're doing? So those are the four waves, two body waves, two surface waves. Uh, these guys here, from the point of view of uh, earthquake hazard, are generally the ones that cause a lot of damage because they just they, they have a long, they, they, they stand around for a long time, and they have a big amplitude, and uh, yeah, they tend to cause the problem. Good. Okay, so now the, the next thing is to talk about <clears throat> how the energy actually propagates. We, we kind of did it as, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, a big force that was coming in and everything was, was kind of moving. But in reality, a lot of uh, sources are very kind of highly localized. And a good example of that would be, uh, you know, a rock coming down in, into a water pool, right? So if we did that, I mean, you've all done this, right? You take a rock, you dump it in, 
and then you get these waves and they propagate out of here. So now we've got, we got waves, you've all seen this. These things go out with a particular speed. They've got some kind of a shape to them and they just kind of propagate out. So those are waves. Each of these guys here that's at a particular crest or trough uh, has got the same phase and, and this is called a wave front. So if I come along here, then this is what the wave front looks like at, at, at this particular time. So there's two ways of describing these waves. One is in a kind of like a, a, a global sense like this, where we're actually looking at the waves and the wave pattern and, and the wave front, right? The other is in describing, okay, how is that wave propagating? And if I'm sitting here, so here's the explosive source, and I'm, I'm sitting here, then the energy is kind of coming in a kind of a direct line to, to, towards me. And I can think about it traveling in a particular direction in terms of like a ray path. So we're going to have two ways of, of talking about waves. One of them is the wave fronts, and the other is when we try to think about a wave and how it's coming. So here's the source and we're out here and we think, okay, how, how is the energy travel? The energy travel has traveled along a particular path. We're going to call that the ray path. And this would be, if I'm sitting here and here was the source, that's how the energy got there. Okay. So that's the ray path. And the ray path, this ray is always perpendicular to the wave front. Okay, so those are just some things to, that we're going to use as, as jargon. We're going to talk about wave fronts of something, and we're also going to talk about rate paths. What I'd now like to do is to show you a little movie clip that has got, that's going to show you how things propagate as a function of time. So what's going to happen here, so we're looking at a, at, at a cross section. So this is depth <laughs> into, into the earth, right? And this is distance along here. And there's going to be a source that goes off here. And initially, there's nothing. The source goes off things start to move outward and just the same as they did with the group of students, you know, one pushes on another and then gradually this wave propagates up. So we're going to watch that as a function of time. And initially what's going to happen is that it's, it's going to be very simple. It's going to be just like that uh, rock that went into the water, you know, the waves go out. But you know, also if you had, like if you had this system here, and then you you put up a you know a, a barrier or a boundary or something like this, uh, that you know it would really change things. You know the the wave would kind of come up and meet this barrier and do something. Part of it might get reflected, maybe part of it gets transmitted. That's just property of waves, and <coughs> that's what happened with water. But that's also what's going to happen with our elastic waves. So I'm going to run this guy. We're going to stop. I'm going to run him a few times first. He's, he's pretty fast. Not sure that I can. Okay, so watch what happens. Oops. Let's see if I can. I have to be quick with the fingers. Okay. So what I've done is I've stopped this movie before anything really serious has happened. So what, what started here was that the, the energy started right here, and then it's expanding outward so that the uh, velocity in this region up here, okay, is uh, a constant and just at a velocity d1. 
these arrows that you have here, okay, this guy that's coming in here, that is the normal to the wave to that wave front, and that is you know the ray path for energy that's traveling along this line. Okay. And for out here, that's the that's the ray path that's coming out there. So what we're now going to do is to start this up again. And we're going to look at what happens here because now we've got energy that's coming into a boundary and things are changing, right? I got a, I got a different velocity here than I have here. So something is going to happen. I mean, maybe everything is going to get reflected. <coughs> maybe something's going to get transmitted. I mean, we, 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 we don't know. Again, it's pretty fast. You can play with this yourself. We'll go through things a little bit more, more slowly. But as this got, as this impinged on here, there was something that happened. First of all, the, the energy that went in here, now it started to, to travel out. And after a certain length of time, it's already traveled out to this distance out here. So the energy came down here, hit this, and now some of it actually got transmitted. And it got into here, but this velocity is really fast. This is faster than up here, so it the the uh, wave travels faster in here. So look at the wave front that where it is in this bottom medium compared to where the wave front was in the top medium. This is a lot farther, down. so it's it's traveling faster. It's uh, getting greater distance with, with the same amount of time. So that is the transmitted wave that we saw here. Then there's also a wave that is reflected, and that's what this guy is here. So the wave has come down, and now it's got reflected, and it starts to come back up, and that gives us. And in addition to that, we also have a direct wave that's just simply traveling its uh, along the, the very surface here at this speed of v1 and here is this direct wave that's that's coming up here so there's a lot of stuff that's going on right so i got i got a wave that's coming in it sees oh wait a minute material properties are different part of me is going to get reflected that's going to go back up here part of it's going to get transmitted so any energy that gets transmitted is going to travel in this lower medium at whatever speed that is and then I still have my direct arrival and there's actually going to be one more thing and that's going to be the thing that's going to be the saving grace for the geological engineers to find the bedrock there's going to be a wave that comes along this interface it's called a refracted wave the wave is going to travel along here and give energy up to the surface and we're actually going to be able to measure that. So let me see if we can see that. So a little bit later, this transmitted energy is here. Here's our direct arrival. Here's the reflected. You probably can't see it, but there's a faint line in here. There's a dark blue line. Yeah, I don't think you can see that. Even if I turn, let me turn this off. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, what oh, can you see? I don't know, it's, a, it's, it's right here. It's a straight line. And as time goes on, and this wave front is here, this wave is going to travel up, we arrive at the surface. So that is refracted energy <coughs> that's coming in. It's going to come in like a regular arrival. You're going to be able to find that guy, and he's going to tell you some information about what this lower velocity um, medium is like. So he's really critical. Uh, okay. Let's see if this works. One of the things that you'll be doing is playing with a, well, you've got, you're going to have four seismic apps. 
Uh, this was one that, this is going to be the first one that you use. Let me try to explain what's going to, to happen here. This is, this is going to be your simulated Earth model. So this is depth. And this is, well, it's listed as offset. Uh, so that's, that's a distance. So this is in meters. And there's a couple of horizontal lines here. So there's one here at 5 meters uh, depth. And there's one here at 15 meters. So that's your layered earth. You've got layer 1, layer 2, like this. Over here, you've got velocities. So velocity 1, 2, and 3. The default values on this is that velocity 1 is 400 meters per second. Velocity 2 is 1,000, and velocity 3 is 1,500. Okay, so what we're going to do is to look at the energy, but now just using ray paths, right? So we're just, we're just going to use rays, right? You're always going to remember, like, oh, my gosh, there's all kinds of waves that are traveling. But now we're just going to kind of think about energy that has managed to get to a particular location. Uh, and we're just going to look at how that energy traveled, and we're going to describe that by a ray path. So we're going to set off an explosion, and we're going to look at various types of energy that I pointed out to you in, that, uh, in, in the movie. And the very first thing that we're going to look at is what's called the direct arrival. So we're going to be sitting up on here and we're just going to look at this direct arrival and as a function of distance so here's here's how the path here's how the ray or energy travels it travels right along the surface <clears throat> as a companion plot to this guy we've got what's called a travel time curve or a travel time plot. A travel time plot is something that's got a horizontal distance on it, connected in this case with the, with the offset, and time. So here's zero time, this is 0.24 seconds, and this is distance along here. This point up here kind of tells us, you know, kind of helps connect what's happening here as far as the arrival time at a particular location. So at 50 meters away from the shot, the time that it took to get there is about 0.12 seconds. So you could check that. How would you check that? If I was to ask you, I'm sitting out here at 50, me at 50 meters, so my distance is 50 meters, and how fast is the energy traveling in here? The, top, the velocity of the top layer was? 400. 400 meters per second, thank you. So the velocity. 400 meters per second. So the travel time? Distance of velocity. Distance is equal to Vt. Right. So T is equal to the distance, which was 50 over 400, which is kind of about 0.125, right? Which is what we got. So that's the connection between the point out here and how long it took that particular energy to, to get there. And this is what it would be for the entire point. OK, so that is the direct arrival. That's the simplest guy. And if you plotted the, uh, seismic, the ideal seismic trace,
looks like this. So this is time. And so here's time zero. And this is sorry. This distance. There's time. Uh, sorry, hold on. I got confused. Okay, we're on plot seismic trace. So we're sitting at one particular, here's our experiment, here's our here's our shot, here's our receiver, and the energy goes off, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens, and then suddenly there's some energy that comes in, and that's going to come in at the time, uh, in this case, 0.125 seconds, and this is going to be our direct arrival. Okay. But there was also other waves that uh, that could travel. In particular, we have we could have a reflection event. Right, so I could have a wave, you know, that leaves here, goes down to the bottom interface here, and then gets reflected back up. Right, and you remember the. Uh, that relationship between the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection. So if this was the angle of incidence, then what does that mean for a reflected event? Re angle of reflection, how does it relate to the angle of incidence? Same. They're the same, right? So that means that this guy is going to come in, he's going to get reflected on a point that's midway be be between the source and whatever that re receiver is. If I look to see how that reflection is, is going, as I go farther and farther out in time, the, the arrival time of the reflected event just kind of blends into the first arrival, right? And you can see that, why that would happen, because you know, the, the length of this line here is almost the same length as the, as the red. There's quite a difference when you're at very close to the to the shot. If I uh, put this guy back, Come on. so if I'm if I'm way back here, for instance, you can see that okay, this line is probably quite a bit larger than the red line, and you can see how much travel time difference there is. But if I go way over onto the right hand side, you know, basically, I'm not sure why it didn't. Is the timing, if you slide the time down, is this showing in the second one? Is it where you're at 0.12? The bottom one? Yeah. Uh, other. Oh, this guy here. Right. That shows you where the radius is. Oh, there we go. Right. So you can see that this link here is almost the same as the red, so that these guys are coming in. So what do we got here? We've got first of all, we've got two two types of energy paths. One that's going right along the surface. That's a direct wave, and then we've got another one that is reflected. And if we plotted the travel time curves for the direct ray or the reflected ray, we see it's got this kind of, of, of a shape. Okay. The next thing, and we'll pick this up again next time, but I want to just show you what happens, is that we can actually have a refracted wave that goes down to this interface, across, <coughs> and comes back up. So that's that little faint line that I was talking about that you, you could hardly hardly see. But that is going to be the, um, the path that the energy takes. And that is actually going to be the refracted arrival. So what we're going to do on Monday, and, and actually what I'd like you to do over the weekend is to go to the, go to the GPG, read this section on the elastic properties and the basics, okay, so there's the, the, the two sections, and then 
<laughs> use this app, so load the app, use binders to explore the app, just so they become a bit more familiar with things. And then, uh, yeah, just kind of play around and, and see what intuition you can get. And then on Monday, we're going to pick it up from here, and we're going to go through some more of the, uh, you know, the details about, you know, Snell's law and refraction, and really try to kind of nail this down and see what the travel time curves are like, and then you can actually go ahead and use those to find things like layer thicknesses and velocities.